Hey, it's Mark Arlapage, founder of Entree Architect, and I want to just drop in real quick. This is uh, the intro to a full unedited webinar called Leveraging Hybrid Proposal. Hybrid Proposal is a, an owner architect document that I created with my attorney for my architecture firm many, many years ago. It's been offered to the Entree Architect community for sale for, for, for many, many, probably about a decade now, almost a decade. Um, and I just wanted to drop in here before we play the webinar to let you know that you can purchase the hybrid proposal course uh, at entrearchitect.com slash hybrid. And uh, it includes a full walkthrough of the hybrid proposal uh, and includes free uh, templates for the entire document. So if you're interested in that, entrearchitect.com slash hybrid proposal. Let's get on with the webinar. Hello, my name is Mark R. LePage, and welcome to this Entree Architects special session webinar. Today's session is leveraging hybrid proposal. Uh, the webinar is exclusively designed for members who have uh, joined Entree Architect Academy and customers who purchased hybrid proposal. This is my way of uh, just sharing more of my knowledge and then hoping that you will do the same. There's no agenda here. This is, I'm not selling anything. This is me sharing how I use hybrid proposal uh, in other ways than just an, an owner architect agreement. Um, in sessions past in webinars uh, where I've shared information about the hybrid proposal and in the course, uh, I mentioned things about my sales system and about my project management system and how the, you know, uh, the hybrid proposal works with that and I've gotten feedback asking questions about that. And so that's why I put together this session, uh, hoping to share some of that information with you and maybe encouraging you to, to leverage the proposal beyond an owner architect agreement. Um, that's what this session is all about. Remember video and audio is currently muted. So just so you know, we can't hear you, can't see you, but we can uh, see your chats. So if you have any questions, you can put them in the chat box. You can communicate among yourselves in the chat box. If you have any specific questions for me, please put them in the Q&A box in your control panel. Just click that Q&A button, put your questions in there, um, and I'll answer all the questions at the end. We're going to have uh, a, a 60 minute session uh, and about the second half of it, maybe a little bit less than half of it, will be uh, a Q&A period in which you will be able to ask me anything that you wanna ask me. If it's, a, if it's a question about what I presented, I'm happy to answer that. If you have specific questions about the hybrid proposal itself, any type of questions, whether it's technical or whether it's a uh, administrative question, happy to answer that. And if you would like to share some of your knowledge during that session, I would love to share your knowledge with the others here. And the session is being recorded, so uh, your information would be uh, shared with others who have watched this video in the future. Uh, and that's what we're trying to do here, share our knowledge so we can get better at what we do. Um, so with that, let's get let's get started. Um, here we go. Okay, for any of you who don't know who I am, Mark R. LePage, I'm an architect. Uh, I'm a partner at Five Cat Studio. I'm the founder of Entree Architect. Uh, my firm, Five Cat Studio, is a residential architecture firm about 40 minutes north of New York City is where we're based in Westchester County. Um, I am partners with my wife, Anne Marie McCarthy, who is an architect, and we do residential architecture. We've been doing it since 1999, and we've experimented with all sorts of agreements, owner-architect agreements, from letters of agreement all the way through the AIA documents, the big ones, the small ones, the multi-page ones, um, and we put together our own document, which I offered as hybrid proposal several years ago, six or seven years ago now, we offered it. Um, and so that's, uh, where the hybrid proposal came from. It was a document that we created for our own firm. It was a document that we, uh, found useful for what we were doing. We continuously, even to this day, edit it and, and it evolves. And so it became a document that worked really well for us. And we just wanted to be able to share it, um, with other architects. And so that's what we did when we launched Entre Architect as a platform for small firm architects. It was one of the first thing I, I offered uh, to the community. So um, the hybrid proposal, it's much more than a legal document that we just sort of sign and, and drop into a folder into the file cabinet and we'll never see it again. At my firm, it's the basic structure for everything that we do and how we do it, uh, including our sales system and our project management system, which is what we're going to get into, into today. Um, there's other 
ways that we leverage it too. It's basically a document that talks about the entire process of, of architecture and how we do what we do. And so uh, that's what the document is. And that's why it leads into other processes. Uh, but before we get into that, I just want to get into a legal disclaimer. Uh, I'm not an attorney. I'm, I'm an architect. I'm in no way recommending that you use these documents uh, presented in the following video presentation. I don't claim that they will protect you, your firm, or your client. I'm simply sharing the documents that we have developed and work well for our firm. I advise you to have an attorney and your insurance company review all your legal documents, including your proposals and all your contract documents. And by viewing this webinar presentation, any recording of this presentation, and downloading any examples of the templates or anything else that we we furnished with the with the hybrid proposal, you're agreeing that I, Mark R. LePage, and McCarthy LePage Architects, my architecture firm, and Entree Arc LLC, which is the company that uh, that is Entree Architect, we have no responsibility for claims that may arise from the use of these documents and may and that you waive any and all liability directly or indirectly. That's really just there so you understand that I'm an architect. I'm not an attorney. I'm not advising you legally about any of this. This is just me sharing my knowledge. So with that legal stuff out of the way, let's, let's get started with this thing. The hybrid proposal, I want to just basically remind you what it is and how it works. I know many of you are already using it in some form or fashion. My intent with this um, course that we put together for hybrid proposal um, was to just share the document. Just put it out there, go through the document, how it works. I step by step in the in the the course, uh, which you've all have access to as members or have purchased the hybrid proposal. It's a course that you're purchasing. The documents are free templates that come with the course. Um, it includes the cover letter, the proposal, the terms and conditions, and the reference sheet. That's the hybrid proposal package that comes with that. If you're a member of the academy, it's part of your membership. It's in the resources section. Um, if you've purchased it, you've been able to download the templates and have access to those. If you don't remember where they are or you need to download them again, um, members can go to the resource section and member pages. But if, you're, if you've purchased it and you're not a member, you can go back to the sales page at entrearchitect.com slash hybrid. That's the sales page for the hybrid proposal. Right up at the top, there's a link where you, if you've already purchased it, you can click that. It will take you to a page where you can sign in uh, and access the course videos again and download the documents. So entrearchitect.com slash hybrid. It's also the place that you could recommend other architects to go to purchase the hybrid proposal. If you find it useful, please send them there to entrearchitect.com slash hybrid. Um, and because the more people who are using it, I think the more people will become successful in what we're doing. So. Today, I'm going to talk about how I use it in my sales process and how I use it in my project management process. There's other ways to use it. Um, we're going to start with the sales, project, uh, sales process, how I leverage hybrid proposal with my sales process. So hybrid proposal is both my proposal and my owner architect agreement. That's why we call it the hybrid proposal, right? Because it's both. It's both a, um, an owner architect agreement and a proposal. Um, the reason that it's that it works so well with my sales system is that the hybrid proposal is a more efficient process. It eliminates the steps between the proposal and the agreement because typically in a process, uh, the traditional process is that you go and you get you you do your marketing. That marketing leads to leads to a lead, right? You get somebody to to call you or email you or however they contact you. Um, that's the first step in the sales process. As soon as they contact you, it goes from marketing to sales. Um, and don't forget, you have to sell. If you don't sell, you don't have a business. And so sales is a very important piece. If you don't have some sort of basic sales system, um, then you're, you're probably struggling because you need to go from marketing to sales to a project. If you leave out the sales part, if you don't have some sort of process that you go through to convert people from contacting you into clients, um, there's, there's, you, you're, you're working on luck. You're working on people, you know, hoping that people are interested in what you're doing and they're going to sign up just because you're you. Um, and the traditional process with sales is that they contact you, you meet with them or you talk with them or however you do it. Um, and then you sell, you send them a letter of proposal, right? That's, the first step is that you let them know 
um, what you're going to do and how you're going to do it and what it costs and all that kind of stuff. The proposal letter in the traditional process um, is not a legal document. It's just an offer. It's just a letter. It's just, it's just a confirmation that you understand what they want and this is what you can do for them, right? You're going to propose a service for them. Um, then they review, you send that to them. You re they review that process. They review that letter. Maybe it goes on the stack of other letters. Maybe it goes into the bottom of the pile and maybe it gets a bunch of bills piled up on top of it. And it takes a long time for you to get any sort of response have to do lots of follow-ups. Somehow that proposal then says, okay, we want to go ahead. And now the next step in the traditional process is put together an agreement. So now you go back to your agreement documents and you put together the agreement documents and you send them off to the, to the prospect. Um, and then that process goes all over again. They, they review them, they get scared because of the language and they look really docking you know, scary documents. They, they put them on the pile because they're nervous and they don't really want to make the commitment because they're not sure and they're scared and decisions are not made when there's fear involved. Uh, maybe they send them to their attorney. Then finally, you follow up with them. Maybe you, you speak with them. They review the agreement on the, on the telephone. Maybe you have a conversation with them in person at a meeting. And finally, finally, they agree and they sign the document and you're off to the project, right? That's the traditional process. That's why we created the hybrid proposal because that process for us wasn't working. There's too much time in between one of those things. There's too many decisions that need to be made in that process. Too many opportunities for a client to, to, to feel the fear or the, the indecision and freeze. So we tried to create a document that was as simple as possible, as friendly as possible, easy to understand as possible. We wanted to eliminate the fear of doc, you know, going forward with us as architects. We wanted to create a document that requires only one decision for the client to make. We wanted to reduce the time between the initial contact and the signed contract. That is the sales process, the time between the initial contact and the signed contract. Before the, time, the initial contact is marketing and after the signed contract is project management, right? You wanted to eliminate that sales pro or, or reduce that sales process. That's your goal, right? As a, as a salesperson, as the owner of your firm, your goal is to try to get the sale, but get it as quickly as possible. Because if there's time, then there's time to uh, make other decisions, other priorities come in, in, into play, other, other proposals come into play, other fears come into play, other priorities happen. And so, by reducing the time between the initial contact and the signed contract, it becomes part of our sales process. And the proposal, the, the actual structure of the hybrid proposal is designed specifically to do these things. The hybrid proposal is a legal document, but more importantly, it's a sales tool, which is what I was just talking about. It expedites the sales process and it's intentionally designed to look friendly and to have easy to understand language. It reduces the risk of the attorney review. Because they understand it, because it looks friendly, it's, it has all the same information that all the other documents have. Not exactly, you know, it's, it works for what we do and how we do it, um, but it has all the information that protects us. And we've designed it so when they look at it, it's not, it's not scary looking. It's not, it's not super legal looking. It doesn't look like a, a, you know, a closing document for purchasing a home. Um, and when they read it, they understand what they're reading. It's not, it's not legal language. Um, it's, it is easy to understand me talking to you language, which reduces the risk of an attorney review. I'm not against attorneys. I don't have any problem with attorney reviews. My issue is that I'm trying to, to convert a prospect into a project. And as soon as an attorney gets involved, in my experience, my personal experience, is that whenever an attorney has been involved, that attorney needs to show some sort of um, uh, value and worth to their clients. Their, the client is going to pay them a lot of money to review this document. That attorney feels obligated to change that document to quote unquote, protect their client. And so they're going to go through it and they're going to scratch all the things 
that potentially might benefit you as the architect. And they're going to do it because, and it may not be necessarily the best for the entire project. It's showing the, the client that they're doing their job. So when they send the bill for the hours they worked on reviewing this, this document, they have something to show for the work that they've done. And so attorney reviews in a sales process are bad. Attorney reviews in general are not, not bad. I use attorneys for all kinds of things and thank God they're there. Um, they've helped us convert and they've helped us purchase things and they've protected us when we needed to. And when we've had issues, um, the attorneys are there. I love attorneys when we need them, but from a sales point of view, you don't want an attorney involved in the sales process. Every time that happens, two things happen. Either they change your agreement to the point where you're no longer comfortable with the agreement. Um, you've created a conflict now, right? Because now it's us against them. It's the, the prospect and the attorney against the architect. So now you've, you've started before you've even started. Now you have this, this conflict, which you, which you've just worked so hard to not have in the, in the sales process. And, um, the contract is probably so much changed that you're not going to even want to do the project anymore because no longer does it protect you. Now you're afraid. Now, what do you do? Do you need to send it to an attorney to make sure that well, all these changes that were changed are going to be okay and protect you? You probably need to do that. So what do we learn here? If we create a document that looks friendly, that's easy to understand, that they understand what they're getting, they understand what we're giving them, you know, they understand what happens if there's conflict, it's all there. It's easy to understand. It looks friendly. They feel more comfortable reading it, understanding it, signing it, and moving forward. And so that's why it's much more than a legal document. It's also part of our sales process. The hybrid, per pee, re, hybrid fee reduces sales friction, right? Sales friction. Sales friction is what's stopping them from saying, let's go. So the hybrid fee is designed to reduce friction. The flat fee, so let's talk about the fee. The hybrid fee itself is, is different. It's part of the hybrid proposal. That's the second reason why it's called a hybrid proposal because the hybrid fee is two things. It's a flat fee based on a percentage fee. A flat fee is what the client wants. The client wants to know what everything's going to cost. No changes, no surprises. Just give me a number so I can make a decision whether I can afford this or not. From an architect, this architect who's speaking, I would prefer a percentage-based fee on everything that I do because I believe it's the most fair. This is a debate that we can talk about over at the Facebook group or anywhere else you wanna have that conversation. I know that's con controversial at times. My feeling is that percentage-based fee is, is the most fair for everybody. Um, and so that's what I want. And so the, the hybrid fee is a flat fee based on a percentage of construction cost. And so that's, that's what it, it's intended, whoop, went too far, uh, went too far. So the initial fee is based on the client's budget and then the project is designed to meet that budget. So before we start anything, we, we, um, we get a client's budget. And so we're going to agree that, okay, we've had this conversation with them prior. They know, we know the scope, general scope of what they want to do. We've talked about budget early in, in the, in the sales process. Um, the project is designed, so this is after we started, this is how we're actually getting paid. The project is designed to meet that budget. So we've agreed that they, this lump of money that they have to spend is, is about as much as they need to build it. So we're gonna design the project to meet their budget. Then at the end of schematic design, the third party, generally a general contractor who's going to provide a bid at the end of the project, we asked them up front to put together a, a schematic design estimate based on our schematic design drawings. And so that's what we're doing um, uh, to, to confirm our numbers. So we're gonna design to the budget, we're going to have a third party, somebody independent from us is going to put together a, an estimate based on a schematic design. We're gonna get that, that number back. We're going to have a conversation and we're gonna say, okay, with the client, here's the scope. It's a clear scope. This is what we're going to design. We have a, uh, an agreed upon construction cost plus a contingency, contingency amount, typically about 10 to 20%, depending on the project. Um, we're going to add that much to the, the construction cost because it's schematic design. There's lots to do. There's lots of design to happen uh, in there before 
uh, it's it goes out to bid. And so we're adding a contingency amount, and then we're all going to agree that this is the scope, this is the cost of construction for this project, and then the fee is set as a flat fee, and it's determined by the compensation schedule, which is part of the hybrid proposal. It's the last page of the proposal document, and that's a picture of it there. And it basically is it's based on a percentage of construction. It goes um, in increments of $20, $25,000, and what I typically do is I just, all those zeros over on the other side in my proposal are filled in with a percentage amount. So it's 12% for us, 12% of 100,000, 12% of 125,000, 12% of 100, and we put those in the document before we send it to them. And so now there's a fee, a compensation schedule. So once we get that schematic design back and we have that clear scope, we have that clear cost of construction plus the contingency amount, that number is what we do. We go on this, this schedule here, we find that number within the, the ranges of the $25,000. We go over to the compensation and that's our fee and we lock it in. And then that fee stays, that's our, becomes a flat fee at that point. Um, and we do the project for that amount. If the scope changes, and sometimes it does, then our fee changes with it. If the client comes back and says, we're gonna add a, a bedroom to this project. Now we go back, we're gonna get an estimate for that, and we're gonna adjust it, or we're gonna get paid hourly or some other way, but it, it changes if the scope changes. If the scope doesn't change, uh, then our fee stays in place. If it goes to bid and it's a different price than we thought it was gonna be, whether it's more or less, our fee doesn't change. Our fee is becomes a stipulated sum at the end of schematic design. That's how our hybrid fee works. I'm happy to answer any questions about that at the end, uh, but I just wanted to remind everybody how, how our fee works, how the hybrid fee works. And then each part of our package has its role. So the cover letter, the proposal, the terms and conditions, and the reference sheet. They all have their role, their part in the sales process. So I want to go through each one of the documents and talk about how that document is, uh, becomes part of our sales process. So the cover letter, the cover letter, it, it's providing clear directions for taking the next step. It explains how to get started with their project. It helps them make the decision. It summarizes the project, right? It says, this is when we met, this is who, we, who was at the meeting, this is what we discussed. It in, incides the proposal, here's what the proposal includes, here's what to do next. Upon your approval, the enclosed documents will ask you to sign them We'll sign the proposal, we'll initial the terms and conditions, send it back with a check. The check should be payable to our firm. Copies of these documents are all gonna be in the project organizer binder. All of that says in the cover letter. So the cover letter is reducing friction. It's reducing fear. It's making everything clear and understandable. That's what our cover letter is doing. That's what's part, that, that's how we're leveraging this part of the, of the package in our sales system. Um, the second part is the proposal document, um, sets clear expectations. The proposal document is very, very clear and friendly. And so you've, you've all had access to it. If you go through it, um, it's designed in a way you can even see the picture there. It's designed in a way that's really clear and understandable. It's not, it doesn't look like a contract. It looks like a document that's easily understood. The legal text up at the top makes it a contract. Uh, it says that it's also attached to the terms and conditions, which is the next section I'm gonna get into. But this looks friendly, right? And it's easy to understand. There's the client's name, there's the project's name, there's the project description, it's all clear. On the next page of the, of the proposal document, it provides a step-by-step -step process, uh, definition or description of the entire process. From, from, from schematic design, actually pre-design, all the way through construction documents and the construction administration. It goes through the entire process, step-by-step in step, clear, easy to understand language, all the way through. And it's actually step, there are little check boxes next to it. So this is the step we're gonna do here, and this is the next step, and then this is the next step. It provides definitions and it, and it provides, it's, it's evolved over the years to be, um, to answer all the questions that our clients have over the, over the years. So every time we get a new question that we haven't gotten before, 
we evaluate the document. Should this question be answered in the document? And so it tries to answer all the questions that a client might have uh, in order to make the decision. So that's what the proposal document does. It's because it's clear and because it's friendly and because it's easy to understand um, and it sets clear expectations, which we're gonna get into a little bit more in the project management part next. Um, and it provides definitions and it answers all the questions that they might have. That's, that's why it works better with the, with the sales process. When you compare it to other documents that are similar that, that, that architects use, um, that are more legal looking, it doesn't do all that. It, yes, it might set clear expectations and it might provide definitions, but it's because it's so scary looking and so legally um, defined, uh, people get a little nervous about that, right? And then so that that uh, reduces the, the time that, that people take to uh, convert. The terms and conditions do look more um, legal intentionally we titled them right from the beginning, we titled them standard terms and conditions for architectural services. That's to make it look like these are st standard. They are our standard terms and conditions. So we named them standard terms and conditions, but it also looks like this is, you know, um, uh, industry-wide standard terms and conditions. And essentially it is, but they're customized for us. Um, we've limited them to two pages, but that's why there's finer print. The finer print is there to make, him, make them understand that this is where the meat of the, of the agreement is. When they see the fine print, um, and it's big enough that they can easily read it, when they read the fine print, then they know that this is where the, the bulk of it is. This is the information um, that they really need to know. The, the proposal talks about the step-by-step -step process. The terms and the conditions of our agreement are in these two pages. And because it's, it's fine print, and it's, and it's two columns, we can fit it on two pages. And that too is intentional. We've kept it to two pages for all these years. Um, we've, we've massaged it, we've moved the, 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 uh, the margins and the headers, and we've done everything we can to keep it on two pages, even if we add something to it, because the two pages makes it look less frightening. It's still legal looking, but it's friendly and easy to understand. It also includes our additional services which is really important. And these are just a few of the additional services that we offer. These are not included in the basic, uh, basic fee. So our, our hybrid fee is, is a flat fee based on percentage. Our additional services are, are from the, in, in the document, they're hourly. Um, very often, if somebody wants to proceed with an additional service, we'll, we'll negotiate that separately and cr provide a, a percentage number or a flat fee for it. Or, or use the hourly fee for it. But things like master planning, very often our clients have a bigger, a bigger scope than they can afford. You know, their scope and their budget doesn't match all the time. And so, or they have this long-term idea of what they want to do over, the, over years, we can design a master plan. So we can design schematic design for everything. And then we can come back and, and proceed in the project with just one part of the master plan. So master planning could be an additional service and anything can be an additional service. That's one of the benefits of a hybrid proposal is that you have total control over editing this and what's in it and what's not in it. So anytime that you want to create an additional service, you can put it in there. Um, our, uh, our existing conditions surveys in the proposal, it's pre-designed and we charge additional for it. It's 75 cents per square foot in addition to our basic services, and that's in our proposal. Um, Every time we start a new project, when we go over there and measure and spend the day measuring and then come back and spend a day and a half drawing it up, we're getting paid for that in addition to our hybrid fee, a fee for our, our architectural services. We call them pre-designed services. So we're getting paid for that even before we design anything, we're getting paid for measuring that. That's an additional service. We do it on every project, so we include it in our proposal, but it's shown as a separate fee. Construction management, if somebody wants us to um, be in control of the construction process. We can do that. We've done, we used to do that a lot. Now that we've shrunk down a little bit, uh, we do it very sporadically and very specifically. One of the things that we've learned from an architect's point of view, um, if we're going to do construction management, we want to be very selective on who we do that with because it becomes very time consuming. Uh, unless we have a, a, a construction division, then it's a different story. You can do it in different ways. Um, 
if you're a member of the Entre Architect Academy, there's a course called uh, the CM course. Um, you can go in the course section of the members pages and there's a whole course on how I do construction management. It's also available for purchase, entrearchitect.com slash CM course, I think is the link. You can purchase that course and it talks all about how we do construction management. Uh, public hearings and municipal reviews. How many times have you gone to the zoning board and sat in a zoning board review meeting for two and three and four and five hours? Um, we're getting paid for those three and four and five hours. Municipal reviews, and when we're sitting down with a building inspector to review a project, we can get paid for that. Interior design services, selecting fixtures and finishes and paint colors and carpeting and anything that's not, not part of the architecture of a project, uh, we can provide as an additional service. Many times clients choose to do that themselves. Uh, most often we're doing that for them and that's an additional service. We're getting paid hourly for, for selecting all of that. Um, very early on, we used to do that as part of our architectural services and do it for quote unquote free included in our fee. Um, purchase and handling. So once we've selected all that stuff in interior design, now we also get paid for purchasing it and managing the process of getting it from the supplier to the owner and making sure that the tile is the right quantities, make sure it's in good condition, um, managing all of that ordering and back and forth. We get paid for that as an additional service. And there's lots of other additional services. Just check out the terms and conditions sheet. They're all in there. Um, I just wanted to show a few of them. Uh, the reference sheet, this is really important for sales. It's actually in there specifically for sales because you want a client and clients want references. If they're not asking for them, they should be. Um, we include the reference sheet in every proposal and we give them a list of 20 or 30 people. Um, and it has their name. It has the person's name who they should contact because sometimes it's a couple give them specifically who they should call the city and state that they're in. So if a prospect wants to pick somebody who's in their town, um, they can do that. And then the code, the unique TM KCM code, it aligns references with our prospects. What it does, you can see in the bottom of that image there, T equals traditional style, M equals modern style, K equals uh, kitchen, and CM includes construction management services. So a client may want to call somebody in their town who've worked on a traditional kitchen with construction management. They can go on that list. They can find somebody in their town with a traditional project who's done a kitchen and we did construction management and they know who to call and they can call. We allow our happy clients to sell us, right? That's the best part of, of this is that when these clients, the prospects are calling these happy clients who are on this reference sheet, they're, 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 you're aligning them with people who are doing similar projects so they can tell this prospect exactly what you did and how wonderful you were and how the process went so smoothly and how you were on time and how the budget worked out and how you worked with a contractor and all these great things that you do as an architect. Um, the client can tell them about that. The client can sell your services for you, right? So look at your reference sheet. How can you modify your reference sheet to encourage your clients and your references to help sell you sell your process for you. There's an article that I did years and years ago uh, on our sales system in depth. You can go to entrearchitect.com slash sales system. It'll be a, a link that'll send you there. Um, and it talks about our sales process. The sales process that we have is very, very simple. Um, it's basically just a bunch of follow-ups, um, but it's all there in sales system. Uh, so you can go there and, and check that out. Let me see. So we're going to get into the next section here. We're at about uh, halfway mark here. Um, we're going to get into project management, which is a little bit shorter than the sales process. Brendan had a question. Did I understand correctly that fee may change if scope changes, but you hold the fixed fee if the budget changes? No, I'm sorry, Brendan. That's not, I may have said that, but that's not what happens. If the scope changes or the budget changes from a client's decision, so the client's going to decide that, okay, now we're going to do a bigger project with more money, then it would change. Um, if, if the client kept the scope the way it was, but wanted to spend a little bit more money, I wouldn't change the fee for that. Uh, what, I, what I meant to say, which was what, I'm tr what, what I was trying to clarify, was that if the bids come in higher than we expected, and the client still goes forward with it, with a traditional percentage-based fee, 
your fee would change with that change in, um, in cost. Our fee doesn't in this. Our, we are taking the risk. It is more risky than percentage-based fee, which is why I like percentage-based fee more, but I get clients to, to sign up quicker with a hybrid, hybrid fee. If it was my choice, I'd percentage because I agree that if our, if our, if our work is going, if the cost goes up, we're probably doing more work at the end. But that's what I meant by that. I hope that clarifies. Jack says, uh, Mark, since your proposal is essentially the same for each project, do you ever try to get it signed at the initial meeting instead of sending the cover letter and wait, waiting for the prospect to follow up? I've, I have experimented with that early, early on. Um, I, it's, it's probably a very good idea. If you're a member, you can go into the, into the, um, the uh, Academy Masterclass section and go check out the sales sections on that with, um, forget her name now, I'm just blanking on her name. But she talks actually about going to the meeting, getting the sale at the meeting. And so it's probably something we should do. I've never done it because I had my system and, and, I, and I didn't want to change it um, because it's just me and Anne-Marie. Um, I try to reduce the time involved in some of this. And so I'm sort of making decisions on that. Uh, Brian's following up on what if, uh, big if, if the cost goes down. Very rarely does that happen, but when it does, our fee stays in place. That's the risk that the client is taking. So our fee, once it's locked in as a, a hybrid fee, it's a stipulated fee. It's no longer based on construction. Uh, the, the, the construction estimate is only there to determine a flat fee based on a real project, and that's the key. That's why it's not locked in upfront. When you lock in a flat fee upfront, you, you have nothing to base it on. If you lock it in after schematic design, now you have a real project with a real scope and a real budget. So then you have something to base your fee on. Um, and then you can give them the stipulated flat fee that they're looking for. And then it just locks in like a real flat fee. Um, Grant says, would the hybrid proposal be appropriate for use as a sub consultant to other professional disciplines, architect using as a sub to an engineer? I don't think so. Uh, I think if you took a look at it, it's really based on small residential architecture projects. Um, it, we've used it for construction for, uh, we've used it for commercial projects, small commercial projects. We have to modify it in some of the language in there because it's really intended for residential. Um, but I would say that would, you should, you know, put together other, um, other documents for that. I'm going to continue on here. I'll answer the rest of the questions in the Q and a section, uh, because I want to get through the proposal, um, how the hybrid proposal is leveraged with my project management process. Keep posting questions in the Q&A box. We'll get them at the end. So if you have questions, definitely put them in there. Um, we're back to clear expectations. I talked about the expectations earlier on on the sales process, but it's even more important in project management. Um, clear expectations is everything for happy clients. If you get the expectations set, then your client will be happy. That's, that's the formula. Make sure they understand what they're getting before they get it, because that's where things break down. If they get some, if they get surprises, surprises get people upset. Even if it's money, you know, even if the cost is going to go up, if they understand that the cost is going to go up, they might be upset up front, but when the cost goes up, they expected it and they're not going to be upset. And so the proposal describes the step-by-step -step process to complete the project. That's what's so important about the proposal doing that and that they understand how the process works from beginning to, to end. That's why it works with project management because it describes our whole process from the beginning to end. Now we have a document to go back to and say, okay, this is the step-by-step -step process that we're going to go through. Um, we actually have checklists that are based on that as well that we go through and, and, and check off. Some of those checklists are in the foundations documents, which are free to, to, members. You can buy them at entrearchitect.com slash hybrid. There's a bunch of documents in there. Some of those checklists are in there. Uh, the terms and conditions identifies all of the possible issues and services we will or can provide as additional services. So it identifies all the possible things that may happen and all the services that we provide. It's setting the expectations that this is what will happen. This is what will happen if there's a problem. This is what will happen if there's a conflict. It's in there so they can feel comfortable and so when the project happens, um, it identifies how we'll handle the issues before the issues arrive. 
you know that in every project you do, there are problems, right? Every project, there's a surprise. There's an unforeseen condition in every project. If you make that clear upfront with your client that yes, there's going to be a crisis. There's going to be a big crisis and we're here for you. We've, we expect that, process, that crisis to happen. We are prepared as professionals and experienced architects to handle that crisis. We will be there, we will manage it. So when the, the contractor comes back with this, oh my God, this is the worst thing that's ever happened, we can look to the client and say, oh, here we are. Here's the big crisis I talked about. Don't worry, we're gonna handle this. This will be, we'll, we'll under, we will take control of this. We'll work with the contractor and we as a team will resolve that problem. That's the kind of thing that I'm talking about. That if you set those clear expectations up front, if you don't set that expectation up front and that crisis happens, everybody freaks out, right? You've experienced that. So if you let them know that it will happen because it's part of the process to have problems and to have these unforeseen conditions happen, it's, it happens literally on every project I've ever done. Something occurs that we didn't expect if you let them know that up front and our and your proposal talks about what you're going to do and how you're going to handle those those issues then they're no longer big problems right you've handled them so the hyper proposal sets limitations this is one of the biggest things in terms of project management that i get feedback from people who are using the hyper pro proposal the document gives specific limits specific numbers of schemes specific number of revisions specific number of meetings. It limits the duration of a project before our fee can increase. Because if a project goes on and on and on, you know, our expenses go up and things happen and are, we can adjust our fee at a certain point. Limits are not always exercised, but they're great to have when you need them, which is exactly what happens. I have all these limits in the proposal. It talks about the number of schemes, the number of revisions, the number of meetings. I don't ever use those unless I have to. I'll give them as many schemes as they need to a limit. And then once I have it, we've all had that client, right? That they just want more and more and more and more. And if you don't have some sort of limit, you have nothing to go back to. When you, when you have that client who just keeps wanting more and more and more, you can go back to the, to the proposal and say, I understand you want more, no problem. We can give you more sign here. We're going to do more revisions than the document, than our proposal uh, identifies. And we've already given you two extras. That's how it works. It gives you the limits when you need them. Uh, I very rarely use the limits. I only need them. I only need them for specific clients at specific times. But when they're there, oh, they, they save you so much time and aggravation and money uh, and relationship. If they understand that there are limits, then they understand that they're going over those limits. And so it's important to have those limits in place. The hyper proposal lets us beat the IPS. There's an article called the inevitable priority shift in the blog, the IPS, the inevitable priority shift. You've all experienced it. You probably don't call it the inevitable priority shift unless you read that article, but it's something that my firm and I uh, figured out years and years ago, the inevitable priority shift. Somewhere along the line in your project with this client, something major is going to happen in their life that's going to shift their priorities from your project to whatever else is important to them. When they start this project, this project is the most important thing to them. They are so excited about it and they're enthusiastic about it and they're ready for it and they're ready to pay the bills and they're ready to make decisions. And then a priority shift happens. Maybe there's a new baby on the way. Maybe there's a new job on the way. Maybe somebody got fired. Maybe there's an illness. Maybe somebody passed away. Something happened in their life that shifted their priorities from this amazing project to something else that's very important in their life. And it's inevitable. We've found that in every project, if it goes too long, something shifts. And so your goal is to beat the IPS. That's like a motto in our office. We need to beat the IPS. The efficient process that the hybrid proposal develops allows us to beat the IPS. If you can beat the inevitable priority shift, it means you can finish the project. It means that you can have a happy client. It means you can get paid for the work that you've done. You can get a full project completed. If you don't, then there's a problem. You need to figure out how you're going to end this project or you're going to put it on hold or whatever's going to happen. If you have a, an efficient process, you can beat the, the IPS. It helps to manage cost. In our fee, it does not 
include estimates. We are not, we are not responsible for the estimates. The hyper fee is first based on a client's budget, somebody else providing that number, then adjusted to the third party schematic design cost. Again, somebody else is responsible for that. And then it's locked in at the flat fee on a real design and a clear scope. So nowhere, unless somebody's paying us additional services to provide construct cost estimates, which they can, um, then we're not responsible for managing those, those costs. And the hybrid proposal talks about that. It requires construction administration. You probably, if you follow me at any amount of time here, you know that construction administration in my office is not an option. And I believe that it should not be an option for you as well. It should be a part of our, our complete process as architects. The proposal requires it as part of our process. It allows us to manage the inevitable crises which occur on every project. And this is the most important part. Well, other, well there's two pieces. One, it allows you to be involved during construction when those, those crises happen. You can manage them and, and work with a contractor because if you're not there, what's going to happen? The contractor is going to point at you. And now all of a sudden you're the bad guy. And that leads to this last thing. It's the greatest marketing opportunity you have. Because during construction, if those crises happen and they will happen and you're not there, you're going to be blamed for them. And there goes your reference, there goes your referral, there goes your happy client, there goes all of your projects that may come from that happy client. If you're there during construction administration, you can manage the construction or administrate the construction process from your end. It gives you some leverage with reviewing a, a contractor's payments and it allows you to meet on a weekly basis or some regular meeting and walk through that project as it's being developed with your client. And they can, sh as those, those, those neurons start connecting and they realize that everything that you've designed is becoming real and they're walking through the framing and they're seeing this beautiful project come to life. If you're not there, somebody else is taking your credit. It's taking your glory. It's taking all of the, the hard work that you've done. Somebody else is getting credit for it. If you're there, they're being reminded that you're the reason for all those amazing pieces of architecture that's being built by this contractor. And it allows you to remind them of that. And so by the end of the project, they're happy and you get full credit and they will ready, be ready to refer you. That's why I call it the greatest marketing opportunity we have. Happy client is your great, greatest marketing opportunity. So that's it. Let's get into the questions. Um, I want you to also share your knowledge. If you have any questions uh, or knowledge, we have about 15 minutes. I'll stay a little longer if you want me to, uh, but let's dive right into it. Grant says, would the hybrid proposal be appropriate? Oh, we already read, we already read that. Um, Grant also says, do you ever provide cost estimates? Do you take quantity take off? I answered that. We don't provide co uh, cost estimates unless uh, we're being paid for it. We do it, do it internally. We're doing it basically cost per square foot internally so we know where we are but we're not we're not con not um uh offering that as you know as a as a service unless we're being paid for it and in and if we're getting paid for it we're typically hiring a subcontractor to do a, a um a uh you know full bid basically for us somebody else does the cost estimate for us if we're getting paid for it because we want to be right on if it's internal we're doing cost per, per square foot um, <laughs> I see that grant. Sorry. The last question he wrote is ignore the previous question. Got it. All right. We got a bunch of other questions here and please post any other questions you may have in the Q and a box or the chat box, either one. I'm looking at both of them. Um, let's see here. Uh, Carrie says if the contractor's schematic budget estimate comes in above, despite you saying that you design to the client's budget, do you charge hourly, uh, for value engineering? Yes. That's actually in the additional services. Um, if we're all agreed that this is the project and then the project goes over budget as part of our additional services, redesign uh, for any reason after they approve the project and the budget, because we're not responsible for that number, somebody else is. If the number is too high and now they want us to redesign, it's an additional service and yes, we're getting paid for that. Uh, Jay says, who's doing the pricing for schematic design phase? So based on a budget early on, then we're doing some internal estimating. So we're making sure that we're, we're on target for schematics. Um, and we're doing that cost per square foot based on our 20 years of experience, knowing what things cost because we're, because we have a target market. Another reason you know, I, didn't, I didn't talk much about target market today, but you've, you've heard me talk about target market many times before. 
one of the best reasons for staying in a niche. You become an expert in this little niche that you do. We do additions, uh, additions and renovations, residential re, re, uh, additions, renovations. We know that that project really well. And so we can do this cost per square foot internally. So we're confident that what we're designing is meeting the budget of the client. Then that, that third party estimate is being put together by a general contractor who will also bid the project later um, to confirm that we're right. I hope that answers that question. Let me just take a quick sip and then I'll answer Michael's question. Okay, Michael says, when the scope of your project for a specific client is relatively simple and some of the terms and conditions don't apply, do you revise the ter uh, terms and conditions or use them as is? I'm assuming that you do not, but that could cause confusion with a client who isn't familiar with the process. Um, that's a similar answer to the last one about target market. Almost all of our projects are, are so similar that we don't need to revise it. If it is a project that's, that's so limited in scope or so simple that, it, that the terms and conditions might be overwhelming or, or unnecessary, we're still using them and we're not editing them. We're just sending them. And then, and then the parts that apply, apply, and the parts that don't, don't. Um, I've also, for very simple projects, maybe for a, a past client, we've, we designed a shed once. We did a really cool modern house renovation and then he wanted a pool house shed, actually a shed next to the pool house. And we designed the shed in a modern style to match the house. Um, we did that as a really simple project and we basically just, um, did a letter of agreement with our terms and conditions, referenced our terms and conditions in a letter. Uh, so it's basically just simple. Then the terms and conditions protects us to do what we need to do. Uh, and it allowed us to proceed. And because the client was a past client already trusted us, just signed it, kept going that client today, even today, I'm basically his in-house architect. Whenever he needs anything done, we're doing it. I get questions probably once a month on that modern house um, that we didn't design the modern house. We did a renovation in it that uh, every time he has a question, he comes back to me and he refers us and he's a great reference. And, and so happy client. It's really important. Uh, Carrie is following up. What I meant was if the client's original budget is a hundred thousand, uh, you do your design aiming for the hundred thousand, but then the contractor does a schematic budget and it comes in at 150, but the client wants to stick with the hundred thousand dollar budget does the client expect you to redesign to their original budget for no extra cost? Um, that, uh, I'm not, to answer your question, the reason I'm, I'm hesitating on that answer is because I, there is part of the agreement, the agreement says, no, we're going to design to your budget. Um, and then the estimate comes back and, and if we have to redesign it, we're going to, going to redesign it. Uh, at additional, but I don't, I don't use that. I'll redesign it. If it comes in, if we're so far off that we're $50,000 over on a hundred thousand dollar project, my ultimate goal, it all comes back to happy client. So if, if I have to sacrifice some time and some money to keep my client happy, especially in schematic design so early on the project, I'm going to do whatever I need to do because the ultimate goal is a happy client. You're happy if your client is happy. They're paying their bills and they're referring you to the next person. And so, happy client is 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 the most important thing at the end of the day. Unless they're taking advantage of you, then you pull out that contract, and and that's what why you have a contract. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, Mark says, do uh, I do a preliminary feasibility study for a project for a separate fee, which perhaps determines the program budget approach and other needs and options, how, uh, how will this work into the hybrid proposal? Um, so preliminary feasibility study sounds, we've done feasibility studies, we just call them master plans, um, would basically be an additional service. So we can do that as an additional service or a negotiated fee, you know, just say, okay, I'm gonna do this for X number of dollars. Um, if you know about how many hours you're going to work. Um, yeah, so that that that's similar to our uh, master plan section. And what's, what's great about the hybrid proposal is you can change the name of, of that or edit it or just add in feasibility study and say, I, you know, my recommendation to all architects is, is create a basic service that you can provide the basics of whatever they need, get a decent fee for that, and then provide additional services for all those other things that we are doing for free, mostly, uh, as architects, pull those out. 
and get paid for them. Clients expect that. Clients, they don't want to be nickel and dimes, but if it's clear and the expectation is clear, um, they're not upset about it. And I don't ever get pushback on my additional services, ever. They, they see what we're go- going to provide. We, we talk about in our marketing, we talk about um, that this is an experience that we're managing, not a project, that, that we're there to manage their experience of a construction project. So that's what we're talking about in terms of marketing, that it's not a set of drawings, right? It's not a permit. That's all part of the experience. We're making that stuff happen so their experience through this process uh, is, is working. And so um, that's part of that. So let's see here. Um, Brendan says, I've lost my shift more than once we get into CA. I've been experiencing uh, with leaving CA as a, to be determined until once the specifics of the project flesh out and the contractors determined, depending on the team, sometimes I'm needed valuable once every two weeks. Other times I feel like the project needs me two half days per week just to keep it reasonably rolling along. This lowers my initial proposal, but as a phase two expected and pending, not sure if it's working as intended though. My experience, Brendan, is do CA full in as part of the project. I will walk away from a project that doesn't want to do CA. I, that is for me so important. Um, oh, he lost his shirt. I see down below. Sorry, Brendan. He lost his, his shirt or he lost his shit either way. Um, <laughs> it's, it's what's important is that, um, for CA, it's not an option for me. I provide CA. We are going to have a regular meeting. Sometimes, most of the time, it's a weekly meeting with a client and a contractor, um, and or some other regular meeting. Maybe it's every other week. And if if they're doing drywall and it's taken two weeks to do drywall and there's nothing to meet with, we just cancel the meeting and we just don't have the meeting. But when you're there every week on a regular basis and you can review payments to a contractor you are showing your value as an architect. And we're all talking about how can we show our value? It's happening in CA. It doesn't happen anywhere else. They don't give a crap what your design looks like. They want it to be beautiful. They expect it to be beautiful. That's, that's, that's a no brainer for them. If, if, if you're trying to sell your, your services on the fact that you're a great designer, they are expecting you to be a great designer. That's not differentiating you from anybody else. They don't know that the other designers are not as good as you. What they know is that during construction, you were there to hold their hand. When that, that beam that was supposed to be there, when they opened up the wall or opened up the ceiling, the beam wasn't there. And now they have to put a beam in and you were there to help that. That's what CA is for because that crisis goes away because you're involved. Um, Jay Crowley says, after listening to some value pricing ideas, yep, go check out Blair Ends in my podcasts speaks about value pricing, super interesting concept. Also in the Facebook group, I just posted an article by Arcus Snapper who references me and Blair in a great article in the Facebook group. Um, go check that out. I'm looking at your compensation page and looking at adding two columns to break down basic services at 10% standard and working title at 12% and full services at 18%. Thoughts? I've considered that sort of giving them sort of a menu of services. My concern, and if you go back to some of the sales um, master classes that we've done, when you give somebody multiple options, then they freeze because they don't know which one to pick. They don't have enough experience to pick one or the other. My, my recommendation is to pick one service, provide a proposal for one service, provide additional services for other things, um, and maybe you are, you are fine-tuning your proposal uh, based on your client. So sometimes that client's getting the 10% basic services fee, uh, sometimes they're getting the standard plus working title um, at 12% and you're matching up your percentages and your proposals. Maybe you have three different proposals, but you're only sending one of them to a client. So they're not making decisions like that. That's my concern is that decisions create fear and fear create frozen clients and they don't make decisions and then you don't get the client. And then somebody else comes along with a simple fee that they completely, completely understand maybe even more maybe it even costs more than what your fee is and they go with them because they understand it. So that's, that's my concern with that. All right. Let's um, I got questions in the chat and the Q and a, so I'm losing, losing scope here. Um, when the scope of your project for relative. Okay. Yeah. I asked that. Um, okay. Michael says not a question, but a comment. Great. Thank you, Michael. I like comments. Um, since we do commercial work, many clients try to discard our, uh, terms and conditions 
and only reference the proposal when they are using their standard contract forms. We always have our attorney review their contracts. Uh, however, I have used the terms and conditions under the heading roles and responsibilities, quote unquote, roles and responsibilities, with the proposal to avoid this. A bit different than the residential market. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the beauty of having your own proposal that you can modify it to, to make it and customize it any way you want. I expect that when people use the hybrid proposal, they're not just putting their letterhead on it and using it. I'm hoping they're modifying it and changing it and reviewing it with their attorneys, reviewing it with their insurance companies and that kind of stuff. So I think that's really important um, that we do that. And so um, we're coming up on the end here. I just wanted to give you these two links, entrearchitect.com. If you're not a member, you can, um, you can join up there. You can join. We're not uh, um, offering mastermind groups right now. If you want to join a mastermind group, email me and I'll put you on a list. But entrearchitect.com, you can join the membership, which gets you access to all of the master classes that I talked about, all of the proposals, all of the documents, everything that we offer, except the mastermind groups, which are peer groups of architects that meet weekly. That's something separate. But other than that, if you join Entree Architect uh, as a member, you get everything that we offer. Um, if you don't want to do that, definitely join. Everybody who's listening should be joining the Facebook group, entrearchitect.com slash group. It is the best group for small firm architects in the world. And I will say that with confidence. If you're in it, you know I'm right. So thank you very much for coming and hanging out with me today. I hope this was helpful. I hope it was inspiring. I hope it motivates you to use a hybrid proposal or a derivative of a hybrid proposal. Just get out there and do it and get paid for what you do. That is the bottom line. Get paid for what you do. Make your clients happy. Thanks for hanging out with me and I'll see you soon.